You mentioned David Rundell. David Rundell is author of Vision Mirage, Saudi Vision or Mirage, Saudi Arabia at the Crossroads. An outstanding book. If you really want to get an understanding of modern day Saudi Arabia, how it, we, we ended up with Vision 2030, who the main players are, and that sort of thing, it's a terrific book, recommended 100%. He and Ambassador Michael Gofella, who's a former uh, political advisor of the U.S. Central uh, Command, also a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, wrote an article in Newsweek. I recommend it to you. It's called Saudi Arabia's True Role in 9-11. Now, <clears throat> the reason I picked this is because uh, we follow, live, we spot a lot of sports. Basically, any, almost any conversation where the Saudis are involved, something comes up. Jamal Khashoggi, of course, 9-11. Um, for you know 20 plus years now it's 9 11 and it's very hard to have a conversation because this is a very serious event we you know almost 3,000 americans died you have uh, a number of 9 11 survivor groups it, they feel it very close to the heart people lost family so you, you don't really want to have a conversation but it always um, frustrated me a little bit in that it in, in their eyes the saudi government was part of this and uh, my take on it was the Saudi government was not part of this. And they're culpable of, 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 a, of a number of things. But in terms of, you know, Saudi government involvement with these attacks, I don't believe there was any. And <clears throat> so in this article that Rundown and Gafella wrote for Newsweek, they run through a number of arguments, very dispassionate, well, well-reasoned, logical. And I just wanted to share them with you. So this is going to take a little bit of time, but please bear with me. I broke it up into the sections they sort of had. This, this is not you know, exactly sequentially like they had it, but this is how I, I, I read it. So started with investigation conclusions. All right, so in 2004, the bipartisan 9-11 Commission report concluded that there was no evidence linking the Saudi government or its senior officials to the attacks. 2016, 28 classified pages of the report were released that did not alter that conclusion. 2021, the FBI released its own previously classified reports on the matter, reaching the same conclusion. All right, so that's one section, sort of evidentiary. Um, another section that they did was on Osama bin Laden. And, I and again, I'm offering this because I think it's useful background if you haven't really looked at it closely. So yes, Osama bin Laden was Al Qaeda's front man and financier. Uh, he fought against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. As we know, the, the, the Mujahideen effort in, in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union was heavily backed by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia and our, our, many of our allies. He returned to Saudi Arabia in 1989 and began criticizing the government for being insufficiently Islamic. He left Saudi Arabia in 1991. In 1994, King Fahad, then king of Saudi Arabia, stripped him of his Saudi citizenship and froze his financial assets making it clear that he was now regarded as an enemy of the Saudi state. This is 1994. Uh, so this, uh, subsequently, the Saudi government sought unsuccessfully to extradite him first from Sudan and later from Afghanistan. Uh, the final report of the 9-11 Commission stated, quote, Saudi government officials at the highest level work closely with top U.S. officials to solve the bin Laden problem diplomatically, unquote. All right, so between, we've referenced this on the show, between 2003 and 2007, Al-Qaeda, which obviously attacked the U.S. in, in, uh, in 2001, began an extremely violent terrorist campaign within Saudi Arabia, explicitly intended to overthrow the government. Al-Qaeda terrorists attacked housing compounds, government offices, oil facilities, and killed more than 100 Saudi police officers. I mean, it seemed like an endless series of shootouts, if you remember the time. All right, so another section, I'll call it Al-Qaeda membership. What do we always hear? 15 out of 19, right? Um, Saudis never made up the majority of Al-Qaeda's leadership or membership. Uh, below, Al Osama, uh, below Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda's Al leadership was primarily Egyptian. Al-Qaeda's foot soldiers came from across the Muslim world with North Africans, Indonesians, Pakistanis, contributing far more than Saudis. Saudis were used to carry out the 9-11 attacks primarily, and this is according to Gefeller and, and Rundell, primarily because it was far easier for them to obtain visas to the United States than it was for their Egyptian or Pakistani colleagues. I would add to this, they did not say this, this is me. It was a strategic masterstroke on the part of Osama bin Laden 
to load up this team with Saudis. And I, I, the intent was very specifically to divide the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, to undermine that relationship, and to get a reaction that was significant. He was, you know, this he was very successful in doing this. Um, so let's talk about second, another section: Al Qaeda ideology. So Al Qaeda's principal ideologue was the Egyptian Ayman Zawahiri, he, he who was essentially was a creature of the Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Zawahiri participated in the assassination of uh, Egyptian President uh, Anwar Sadat, openly called for overthrow of Arab monarchies, and obviously Saudi Arabia is an Arab monarchy, um, and was at odds with the Saudi religious establishment in any number of ways, not only because they supported the Saudi monarchy, but also, uh, as we see later, the, the Saudi religious establishment really did not like suicide bombing. This is against their religion. Um, so they didn't like terrorism in general, but suicide bombing was a particular no-go for them. So Rundell and Gefella finally get to policy and logic. They say Saudi Arabia is a relatively weak nation militarily with a lot of wealth to protect. It values stability has long opposed anything that unsettles the Middle East, including Soviet Union's Marxism. This was one of a, a strong tie that that bound the U.S. and Saudi Arabia for many decades was, uh, you know, that because Soviet Union and Marxism was godless, Saudis did not like that. Nasser's Arab nationalism, again, anti-monarchical. Khomeini's revolution, again, you know, the, the revolution was specifically targeting Saudi Arabia and Sunni and all Sunni regimes. Uh, and finally, bin Laden's jihad. Uh, it has, Saudi Arabia has depended on security commitments made by numerous American presidents, starting with Harry Truman. It would make very little sense for Saudi Arabia to cooperate with its sworn enemy, Al-Qaeda, to launch an attack on its most extreme, the most important strategic partner. That's their close. And they say, which I think was true for all of us, should new evidence come forward after 22 years, we're open to it. But there's nothing to this point, evidentiary, uh, uh, in terms of motive, that would suggest the Saudi government supported this or was involved with this in any way. So, and I want to close here. Um, so when somebody says 9-11, 15 out of 19, to me, I think they're, uh, they're, it's, it's, I don't think it's an accurate portrayal of Saudi government involvement. What the Saudis are culpable of um, and it is essentially an extended period of misguided support of groups and individuals who promoted religious extremism. And uh, it, there's an interesting comment in, um, in Rundown Lake Fellow's article, and it says, quote, Saudi Islam is a long tradition of puritanical intolerance, which has most often been directed against the religious practice of other Muslims, unquote, Muslims, unquote. So, in the post-79 Iranian Revolution era, Saudi Arabia moved, as we know, moved sharply to the right, became much more conservative, really handed over much of its you know, the, the key control of schools and other ministries to the clerical establishment. And uh, what you see was, you saw was textbooks that promoted anti-Shia, anti-Jew, and anti, you know, non-Muslim sentiment, along with other intolerant themes. You also saw, again, under the rationale that we have to count, counter um, Iran's expansionism and their efforts to subvert Sunni Arabs, neighbors. So you also saw significant funds sent abroad to madrasas, Sunni affiliated associations, welfare groups, all manner of charities that were poorly vetted and not supervised or monitored. Uh, uh, and too much of this money, as we know, went to extremist groups pursuing extremist activities. So you know, so again, from the Saudi point of view, they were responding to what they thought was a, a real threat from uh, Shia Iran. Uh, so anyway, to go back to the beginning, well, I don't, I don't believe the Saudi government was involved in 9 11 attacks. The rise of Al Qaeda and other Sunni extremist groups, however, was boosted by Saudi Arabia's post 1979 financial largesse and supportive and more conservative Sunni Islam. They're disconnected. But you can argue there was, you know, there was a, there was a, 
uh, ferment in a culture out there that the Saudis inadvertently or negligently fed. Um, and it wasn't until the blowback of terrorism in that two, 2003, 2007 period where you had, you know, terrorism in within Saudi Arabia that they really sort of fully understand the extent of their mistakes. So, and as we know, to close, you know, one of the things the Saudis have done really well is close up the, the, the you know, loopholes and charitable giving controls, really moderate the Islamic messaging, clean up their textbooks. These have all improved considerably since, and they understand why it matters. But again, you know, I, I don't want to, I want to, I want to sort of address the, you know, 15 out of 19 argument mm -hmm. about government involvement, but I also don't want to uh, exonerate Saudi Arabia from some of the, the, the policies it had in the post 79 era, you know, all the way through the early aughts. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, there it is, you know, back to the beginning. It's a really interesting article, Newsweek, uh, David Rundell, Michael Gefeller. I, I recommend it to you. This is an important piece of journalism because it's really a statement of facts that, you know, if you're on one side of this thing and you hear people say 15 of the 19 terrorists uh, on 9-11 were Saudi, it's just really hard to say, well, you know, it's just really hard to come back to that. This is the comeback. This is the statement of facts saying, look, like, here's the reality. Most of these of the members of Al Qaeda were not terrorists from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia as a state had a war against Al Qaeda and AQAP, Al Qaeda in the American Peninsula. You talked about the clampdown on charity and terrorism financing. In 2019, uh, actually the embassy released a stat sheet of every single thing that they've done since then. Since then, excuse me. The terrorists that brought down those planes on 9-11 and their leadership considered the government of Saudi Arabia one of their chief enemies, possibly even more than the United States, because it had sided with the United States. So I think this is an important piece of journalism. And Richard, we talked a, lot, a little bit about it before we started recording. It's really remarkable just reading it saying, OK, wait, um, you know, but this is still the number one thing that comes up in the US and kind of around the world when we talk about Saudi Arabia's influence in sport and you know, Saudi money into different sports and really just anything. It's this and Jamal Khashoggi. And this reminds me, this piece reminds me of the feeling or the sort of epiphany that I had when I read um, Ali Shahabi's piece on the new Saudi Arabia, which you and I talked about offline. And we've had a lot of people comment online suggesting we discuss it. But I mean, it's a similar thing where he's talking about the new foreign policy of Saudi Arabia, but the second paragraph is about Jamal Khashoggi realizing that we can't talk about these other things until we talk about this and we have the discussion centered on Jamal Khashoggi and 9-11 so that we are on the same plane talking about these facts. And, you know, he says this Khashoggi tra tragedy is five years old, gruesome murder. Um, you know, uh, the, the Saudi official position expressed multiple times that this crime was a horrible aberration, never to be repeated. And one data point, however shocking it may be, does not make for a trend line. He also then goes to discuss human rights standards and these other things going on in Saudi Arabia that are the things that, you know, we talk about and then says, hey, here, here are all the ways that Saudi Arabia is changing for the better in, in an alignment with U.S. interests. So, um, I mean, this this is it's a little bit of a rambling response to the piece because it is one of those things where it's like we need to. We need to have a discussion about this and we need to talk about 9-11 and these facts about Saudi Arabia, because just to say that, you know, 15 of the 19 hijackers uh, were Saudi is sort of it's unfair to, to now 22 years later to say that, well, nothing you can do is right because of this. So it's not excusing anything. And, and again, like the preamble of this was a, a horrible event. It, it did change the world. But, you know, the United States didn't invade Saudi Arabia uh, after 9-11. Like, so to be like, well, Saudi Arabia did this, did 9-11 is unfair to say, in my opinion. So complex issue, you know, just a uh, difficult is. subject, but a great piece, Richard, and a great one big thing. Thank you. And you make a good point. I mean, it, it, it you know, not only is it inaccurate in, 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 in the opinion of Gefeller and Rundell and me, uh, and you uh, us to 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 pin this on the Saudi government. Uh, unfortunately, that that mantra fifteen out of nineteen freezes everything in time. And yes. it, and like as you as you reference in the Shahabi piece, it you know it it uh, it's a tremendous obstacle to moving forward to something that's changed and maybe something that's better. 
imagine if the United States was only known by its two worst things that happened. What would that be? Well, it's fascinating. There's the, the and now we digress. Now we digress. <laughs> now Welcome to the, something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Welcome to the 966 Match List. We will be deeping, no, deep diving into this. You know, James Dorsey writes a lot on the piece, but their their barometer come out came out, which is considered the most widely and most the most uh, the thorough sort of political opinion survey of the region, the Arab and Middle East. And and a, a lot of the things that obviously it's it's um, attitudes towards the U.S. And so much of what's going on in, in terms of uh, uh, decline in perceptions about the U.S. is credibility. And, you know, the, the, the terrible events of 9-11 led to some very poor choices in, ter in terms of, of foreign policy. Um, you know, the global war, war on terrorism, while experts and professionals will tell you they're real terrorist threats, which I do not deny or, or question, you know, the global war on terrorism was was a tremendous overshoot that got us into some real uh, bad situations, situations that that I think we now regret in many ways and, and, and are hurting us in our credibility. Situations like Guantanamo, like Abu Ghraib, like so many things that that uh, were a departure from what we preached and what we preach. And we have a credibility deficit in the middle east uh people think we're hypocritical people think we don't abide by you know what we you know what we say in terms of liberal democracy and about human rights and any number rule of law any number of things they think we're hypocritical we think we're inconsistent a lot of this came about in the aftermath of 9 11 and this is why i say osama bin laden you who has been you know killed justifiably so and you know is a terrorist through and through and can, you know, can't be committed anyway, but as a strategist, he was mightily successful, you know, as someone who hated the U S hated Saudi Arabia, uh, wanted to bring the each down, um, you know, the, the aftermath of, of nine 11 played out a lot like he would have hoped. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know how that's going to be taken. I consider that sort of an objective dispassionate assessment. It's not that I'm endorsing it. I'm just saying it was an extremely sexy. You know, the overreaction, the reaction of the U.S. led to a lot of the things, and that is alienation from the region, decline of U.S. influence that Osama bin Laden really wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And what would he want? He would want, you know, the beginnings of this. He would want the Arab world to really, you know, distrust us. And like you said, credibility gap. That's what he would want. He would want the U.S. to continue on with a uh, incorrect and wrong stereotype in order to divide us. So, I mean, you know, that's not good. Richard, I'm glad you used def, uh, a credibility deficit because that's so interesting the way you put that. And that's becoming expensive for the United States as other people just fill it in. So Beautiful point. You know, our brand equity is significantly diminished. I want to throw in another thing is because we created a, a sort of a rampant Islamophobia in the U.S., which, again, you know, uh, distanced the region and put them off. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 you know, so many bad outcomes from that horrible event. Um, the best you can do is try and shine a light on it, light on it and try and do better. And um, so there you go.